thank you very much. And again, I'm, I'm sorry for missing this the first time around, and I feel like I've risen from the dead, so possibly today is an appropriate day to revisit this talk. Um, I'm going to tell you just about um, some problems that I'm interested in around polynomials defined over the integers and the rationals. Um, and, you know, broadly speaking, the idea here today is to try and understand the density of integer solutions to polynomial equations or systems of polynomial equations. And uh, when we have homogeneous polynomials, this is just going to be the same thing as looking at uh, uh, rational solutions. And just to motivate you, if you're not a number theorist, this is a, a random example. Well, not particularly random. But this is an example of a Diophantine equation, which crops up in PDE, um, uh, where solutions to this particular uh, uh, PDE represent uh, Rosby waves, these meandering waves in the atmosphere, and you can index the solutions by pairs of integers, and somehow there is a community that's interested in figuring out when Rosby waves resonate, and if you're given a Rosby wave, what's the probability that another Rosby wave resonates with it, and it turns out that that reduces to this very beautiful Diophantine equation, which is a you could think there's a degree five surface in P3, and normally that's sort of pie in the sky territory from the point of view of Diophantine geometry. But uh, this was an example that I saw in, um, it was highlighted by Ligarius actually, and one of his PhD students worked out that actually this is a surface you can analyze a little bit. It's a rational elliptic surface. It actually has a parameterization. So anyway, if you work in PDEs and you have other examples of Diophantine equations, I'd be very happy to hear from you. Um, I'm gonna start by talking about integer points. And I'm going to start by focusing on uh, cubic surfaces. So it's a very simple setting. You just have cubic polynomials and three variables defined over the integers. Uh, this is an example of a uh, KD cubic. So it's the unique cubic surface with the maximal number of singularities. Um, but their arithmetic is uh, very, very much beyond the veil. Um, and it's hard to say much about them. Today I'm going to be talking about density of solutions. So I define a counting function, which is the number of integer vectors x, y, z, which are zeros of this cubic polynomial, and which line a box. And I'm going to be interested in letting that box size go to infinity, and what can we say about this kind of counting function? Uh, so you can write down some examples where you can produce lower bounds. So there's a, a, an example of a particular cubic surface, uh, which has many points, so a polynomial in B number of points, but it's just due to the fact that it contains, uh, if you like, a parametric solution. There's an A1 curve contained inside this. Uh, there are other examples, so uh, I'll mention them again, but sums of three cubes has been of interest recently. Um, but again, many years ago, people had already noticed that there are certain parametric solutions of, uh, of that particular equation when we take um, the sum of three cubes equal to two. And again, you get a lower bound for the number of solutions. But somehow those aren't the sort of, those don't represent what's necessarily going on on the surface more broadly. So it's reasonable to delete any of these uh, parametric solutions and try and think about what's left. So I guess to start with, you need to think about, um, can you say anything about these curves? How do you know when you de deleted everything? Um, I don't think we'd have a very clear answer to that, but I just want to illustrate there is at least some work in that direction. So these cubic surfaces are examples of so-called log K3 surfaces. And at least over the complex numbers, people have started thinking about um, you know, when do you get countably many, um, or uncountably, no, when you get countably, countably many finite, uh, sorry, infinite number of A1 curves on given log K3 surfaces, and can you classify this situation? So people have started thinking about that. Obviously, it's more subtle when you try thinking about what goes on over non-closed fields. So I mentioned sums of three cubes already, but here it is again. Uh, so the, the conjecture in this area is that uh, if you have uh, this particular Diophantine equation, x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed equal to k, then provided it passes the necessary local tests, namely that it shouldn't be four, plus or minus four mod nine, uh, then it should have infinitely many solutions. And in fact, actually, Heath Brown came up with a heuristic which would suggest that the number of solutions uh, should grow like log b. Um, but obviously, it's quite hard to get any numerical evidence for that. Uh, we only know one example when k is equal to 42. So it's very hard to sort of test this conjecture numerically. 
An example where you can do a lot more, uh, which I'm sure is familiar to some of you here, is the Markov surface. And so this is has this shape of the sum of three squares being three times uh, x, y, z. And the beauty of this example is that it has this uh, family of involutions uh, on the surface. So if you're given any integer solution, you can produce uh, at least another one for free. Um, and this was put to good use by uh, Zagier in the early 80s, who used this tree structure of the common solutions to count how many solutions there are and to produce an asymptotic formula uh, for this uh, counting function I defined earlier. So in fact, it grows like log b squared. We're dealing with very kind of sparse sequences of integers here. This particular set of integers is very interesting. Um, and there has been a lot of recent work on it um, here particularly. So we now know, for example, that uh, infinitely many of these integers are composite. Um, and you can analyze properties like strong approximation. Um, but today, I'm just really going to be talking about this particular counting function. <coughs> So I guess my motivation in the first part of this talk, first part of this talk is to try and explain the power of log b. Um, and one of the factors in that is an understanding of the uh, so-called divisor at infinity. So basically, I just mean you know you have your cubic polynomial. It's not necessarily homogeneous, but if you just look at the homogeneous top degree part and set that equal to zero, that's the divisor at infinity. And Topologically, most of the real, sorry, most of the integer points should really coalesce around that divisor. And so I've illustrated that with this picture. Um, it, it is actually the, uh, it's like a, taking a different coordinate system for the Markov equation so that you can actually see the three uh, lines, x equal to y, uh, sorry, x, y, z equal to zero at infinity visibly. And you can see for yourself that the, the integer solutions uh, tend to, yeah, 100% of the time, they coalesce around these, these three lines, in particular around the, uh, the points of intersection of any two of the lines. And it turns out that this uh, phenomenon um, is, uh, is, uh, is reflected in this heuristic. So this is the kind of main result, but it's really kind of a non-result. It's not really proving anything. Um, there is this technique in analytic number theory called the circle method, which I'm sure some of you have heard of. Um, and it is, uh, it can be very powerful in many situations, but it can also be a very useful heuristic tool. So for example, when you're looking at densities of twin primes or whatever your favorite pro counting problem in analytic number theory is, you can often use this as a heuristic tool to work out what you might expect for, for asymptotic formulae. And that's what we tried to do for this family of cubic surfaces. So I think we were taking smooth cubic surfaces and we wanted to try and analyze the hardy little bit heuristic. And we were arriving at this conclusion that it does indeed seem to grow like a power of log B. Um, it's a slightly subtle thing because you don't, you don't want to follow the sort of the usual hardy little heuristics where you just look at major arcs and minor arcs. Um, because in this situation, it can happen that um, it can happen that the singular series diverges, and so somehow the choice of major arcs that you make will have a strong effect on the leading constant that you get in the, in the heuristic. So instead, we adopted um, the, the sort of smooth delta function analog of that, which allows you, at least in principle, to write down some prediction for the leading constant, um, which we'll see doesn't seem to reflect. The example that we saw previously, um, but it also highlights possible powers of the of the of the power of log b, and there are these two uh, integers that play a role here. One is the rank of the Picard group, and somehow that's related to uh, the divergence of the singular series in the Hardy Little heuristic. And then there's this other exponent b sub d, which is related to the fact that actually in this situation also the singular integral. Um, diverges uh, when you're looking in this, in, in this uh, sort of log k tree world. So b is, is the number of components of this divisor at infinity which share a common real point. Okay, well, first thing you can do is you can run it on the uh, particular case of sums of three cubes, and it matches uh, exactly the prediction of Heath Brown. So it's not a very difficult calculation to show that the Picard group is, uh, is trivial in this case, is zero. And uh, we saw that there is this um, 
the divisor at infinity here is just a genus one curve, so it's certainly irreducible. And it has a real point. Um, so that, uh, that matches the Heath Brown prediction. But we also wanted to run it on the, the Markov case, just to sort of control it. And you, you can do that. Um, it's a, li a little bit more subtle because here the, the uh, analysis requires smoothness. Um, but if you pass to some desingularization, you can recover some information about the Markov equation. Uh, but there are some other, there's another family of surfaces which happen to be smooth, uh, which were looked at a bit more recently uh, by Baragar and Meda. Uh, obviously, have a very similar structure to the Markov um, example. Um, and they have this, uh, these pre sorry, indexed by these coefficients. And you need the coefficient to be. On the one hand, generic enough that uh, the surface is, uh, is smooth. That's the first condition. And the second condition is there to ensure that you get the same uh, sort of Vieta involutions occurring at this surface. So you can actually, starting from one point, you can generate uh, all of the points and, um, and therefore count them. Um, so this is what they do. And actually, you find that um, with these conditions, there are only six of them which have integer solutions. And I've listed them by the coefficient vector. And for each of them, you get uh, log b squared times a constant. And again, it's reasonable then to look at this and think about whether this matches this, this heuristic that, uh, that we wrote down. And so I just look at the first example um, with uh, coefficients 1, 5, 5, 5. Um, I've drawn it. You can see in, this is in R3 what it looks like. It turns out that it has these five connected components, real connected components. I think these are just the points at very small height, so size at most 10. Um, but I just wanted to, I guess I want to, I mean, the, the leading constant that you get is a little bit complicated. Um, I guess what happens is that you, um, you find that if you start at a certain vertex, um, you count the number of points above it, and you get better and better estimates for that as the height of the vertex gets larger. Somehow, when you take that process to infinity, it leads to this uh, kind of complicated leading constant. But the main, I guess, the main takeaway point is that it's a sum of things, which is really unlike the, uh, the sort of circle method point of view. And its numerical value turns out to be five, five point two. So it's reasonable, as I say, to try and run the heuristic on this example. And what we find is that you get quite good. Uh, uh, alignment in terms of the power of log b. So the Picard rank here is zero. Uh, we have this triangle of lines at infinity. So um, you know the, uh, the, the maximal number of components which meet in a real point is indeed two. Two of the lines meet in a real point. And so uh, we recover heuristically that um, the number of points grows like log b squared, which is great. But the leading constant doesn't seem to look anything like what we find. Examples of Baragar and Umeda. I mean, here you can see it's a product of things, it's a product of local densities. Um, it seems to have 2.9978. That's a bit frustrating. And we spent a, a while trying to figure out, or trying to think about all possible adjustments we could make to this predicted leading constant so that it would match um, the examples proven. Um, there's no reason to suspect necessarily that even possible. We weren't able to do it. I and just tell you a couple of things that we tried. Um, so one thing that you can do when you're analyzing integer solutions to Diophantine equations, one of the tools you have available is the brown manner obstruction. Um, and so this is usually used to, um, uh, as a, a to, to explain failures of the integral Hasse principle. But you can also use it to explain failures of strong approximation. And so what we did was calculated what the brown manner obstruction was in this particular example. Um, I think the Brown group is generated by three uh, quaternions. It's like Z mod 2Z cubed. Um, and when you do the calculations, you find that actually the set of integer points doesn't have dense image in Z3 cross. Uh, Z3 points cross the Z5 points. I think the constants, even in Zagia, you got the constant wrong. Right. It's very rare for him. <laughs> so I'm saying the constant is ah. <laughs> subtle. Wait, is, is this agreement with the uh, high level heuristic 
happens in a similar way for the example that Baragano might have. Had. So you have this one example where yes, minuscule. the constant is the numerical value is 5.2 and this one is yes. What I'm saying is a is a pattern to the discrepancy between how you would well, I mean, we've only got six examples to play with, and we couldn't spot one. Yeah, annoyingly. This is what the Brown Manor obstruction gives. It tells you that there is a failure of strong approximation into the image of Z2 cross Z5 points. But it, you know, it's completely explicit, and therefore you can, well, just as in, if you know, just as, as in what happens in the regular Manning conjecture about rational points, which I'll get to uh, soon, you can adjust, it's reasonable to adjust those factors to take into account the, uh, the, obstruction, the obstruction that the Brow group gives, and it leads to a, you know, a reasonable thing to do when you're adjusting these local factors at three and five. So I think there's some congruence that happens mod three, and it implies that whenever that congruence happens, it should also happen mod five. But you, in these examples, you get these other obstructions occurring, which have nothing to do with the Brown manner obstruction. So one is that if you look at just the point plus or minus one, zero, zero, that actually only ever lives to one point, one integer point. So that's a very strong failure of strong approximation. And moreover, it happens at every prime. So anyway, certainly a reasonable thing to do then is to, to remove this point from, from sigma p and adjust to the value of sigma p. You get something similar for um, the other trivial solutions, provided that I guess p is, plus or minus one mod five, so when five is a square mod p. Uh, and so you want to make similar adjustments for these. And yeah, anyway, when you do that, um, you don't, it doesn't match what we were hoping it to match. When you look at the ratios, I don't know, it gives some real number. Um, it's not obviously some rational number of low height. Um, and as I think Alex was mentioning, if you look at some of the other examples, you're not, you get different ratios occurring at each point. So it's not, uh, not, inclined, not inclined to, inclined, entirely clear what conclusions to draw from this. Um, maybe it's just too optimistic to think that we can hope to explain these situations where you have a, a group action acting on the points. Um, it would be interesting to think, I'd be happy to hear about other suggestions that people might have for looking at some of these cubic surfaces. Once you move into situations where there aren't group actions, um, it becomes very hard to say anything. I mean, this is one example. Some of the cubic surfaces, you can, you can view them as families of Pell equations, uh, but they're Pell equations running over you know, these weird real quadratic fields with uh, very lacunary discriminants. I know that there are conjectures about how regulators of real quadratic fields are expected to behave, but how far is it reasonable to suppose that those hold when you, you run over sequences like this? I, I don't know, but if one had some reasonable guesses, then I guess you could make, maybe you could prove some lower bounds for the accounting functions. That would be interesting. Um, but yeah, when you move to higher dimension, there's this, this kind of thing can go on, which is this lovely paper by Alex and some of his collaborators. So you look at these higher dimensional versions of the Markov equation, and, and there it seems that you get completely weird and wacky powers of log B occurring, which don't even appear to be in as soon as n is at least four. So it's, it's sort of doubtful that the hardy little heuristic would ever have something useful to say about that kind of example. Okay, I am going to rapidly leave the world of integer points behind, it's been too difficult. Um, and let's talk about rational points. So here, there is this very beautiful conjecture that's been around for a number of years now, um, which aims to uh, put on a fairly general footing what we expect when we're counting uh, rational points on varieties of bounded height. Um, so it's very similar to the, the counting function that I defined before, except that everything is homogeneous. And we are going to put ourselves in a situation where we expect there to be many points, many rational points. So projected space or toric varieties or Grassmannians. Um, and we'll, so this conjecture predicts very precisely uh, how these kind of counting functions uh, should grow. Um, and you find that it grows polynomially in B um, times some power of a logarithm, so very much uh, faster growing than the sort of thing that we were seeing 
uh, over the integers. But you do get um, this uh, phenomenon that you also need to be make to, to make sure to be removing uh, awkward subsets of rational points, which uh, would uh, interfere with the kind of predictions that Manin and his uh, collaborators were making. So just as we saw earlier for the A1 curves on these cubic surfaces, here it's very reasonable to remove certain sub-varieties from your Fano variety. So this is the famous taxi cab number. Ramanujan wasn't interested in representing numbers as one cubed plus 12 cubed, uh, in this, as also as 12 cubed plus one cubed. He was interested in genuinely different ways of representing integers of the sum of two cubes. And more generally, um, at least for these cubic surfaces, you would, uh, you would want to remove points on rational lines contained in the cubic surface because they have too many points and they kind of occlude what's going on. Um, but you also get other phenomena happening, which um, can be uh, slightly more subtle. So this is something I've worked on recently with um, uh, Dante Pinolas and Zhijian Huang. So this is an example of a Fano threefold, which is equipped with a, uh, a vibration into quadrics, and you can count points on it. It turns out, and you get an asymptotic which agrees with uh, the Manning prediction almost, except that you, you end up getting these two main terms which have the same size as the function of B, different constants. And the first constant is exactly the sort of prediction which is motivated by the Hardy Littlewood heuristic, really. It's a product of local densities. But the second constant is, is, is not, it's more, uh, more subtle, and it comes actually from just this set of rational points on the variety for which the product of the L's, so the product of these four linear forms is a square. And so that equation, that just that bottom equation defines, uh, well, defines an elliptic curve. And in fact, so today's version of the conjecture would be that um, there is, there's always gonna be some thin set of rational points uh, which you need to remove from the variety and then you just count what's, whatever is left. And that's what's happening here. There is this thin set of rational points. There, it's a zeristi dense set, but um, still it's thin in some sense. It comes from um, points lying on an elliptic curve, an auxiliary elliptic curve. And if you remove these, then, uh, then things should behave, well, things behave as they're predicted to, uh, which is nice. But I guess in general, uh, here it was quite easy to spot maybe what the thin set is or what the bad set is. You could imagine that in general, if you're given some random Fano variety, it might be quite hard to actually figure out a priori what, what set should you be removing in order that the set of rational points behaves as it's predicted to. So there is work afoot in this direction, uh, which uses some pretty sophisticated tools from algebraic geometry. I think it uses the boundedness conjecture of Burkhar, which gives you a algorithm for deciding what are your thin sets in any particular situation? But it's far from being uh, it's, it's far from being made to work in every situation. But it, yeah, it's very interesting. But you could ask: Is there a more direct approach to tackling this? And that uh, is going to lead to talk about uh, this. Is. Um, so. Let me just you. So we we a key role then in this story is going to be played by uh, by lattices of, of given rank, and in particular their successive uh, minima. Um, so if you're given a, a lattice of rank R, we're going to let S i be the least uh, positive number such that this lattice contains. Um, I linearly independent vectors of length bounded by that number. I think all we need to know about them is that uh, they. Can I go back a second from yeah. the general discussion? So uh, the Manning conjecture would imply that the leading term must be x to a power times log x to an integer. The x to a power depends on how you choose your height. Yeah, that's right. But the log. So if you ever had a log to a fractional power, you, you would be in trouble. Yeah. I guess he conjectures the height zeta function has a slight meromorphic continuation as well. Right? That's right, yeah. Yeah, with a pole of order equal to the rank of the Picard group. 
So when the exponent, which you, uh, uh, which is the, the big exponent, and uh, is there some canonical way of, of choosing your height so that that's meaningful? Yeah, um, yeah, I should have actually written down what the conjecture gave, but I mean, you always have the anti-canonical divisor when you have a Fano variety, and that gives you an embedding into projective space, and then you take the height function associated to that anti-canonical divisor. If you do that, then the exponent of B is always one, so it's just a way of norm okay. normalizing your height in okay. such a way. But if you worked with different height functions associated to other ample line bundles, yeah, there, there is also a prediction of what the exponent is. So how you choose that. I had an argument with him when he first made the conjecture. <laughs> Man, uh, he, he said there was a Hardy Littlewood uh, measure associated with the variety, but that actually is not well defined because the variety need not be given by a fat. The minute you do Hardy Littlewood, you, you think of fattening. Mm -hmm. Has that been sorted out? I think so. I think that's more or less what goes on into Emmanuel Payer's paper. It's quite general, or it's I mean, he looks, I think he looks at fan of arbitrary fan of varieties. And he has a, he defines a Hardy little wood measure. Yeah. yeah. Just for the variety. Just for the variety. And, and it doesn't have to be defined in a, I mean, it doesn't have to be a complete intersection. It doesn't have to be a complete intersection. I think he, he, yeah, he calculates explicitly what it is for some flag varieties. And yeah, okay, then. <laughs> yeah, then. Okay. Uh, yeah, but I, guess, I think this is his notion of the Tamagawa measure. Essentially, right, but that, uh, what, the minute you start with that, then there's usually a natural flattening of the variety to level sets. Then there's a well defined thing. I mean, I mean, you don't want a definition which depends on how you define the defining equation. But anyway, I just wondered if yeah. it's really been sorted out. Okay. Sounds like someone sorted better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah. So, but don't worry about it. No, no. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, um, ordering points essentially on varieties differently. Um, so again, height is going to be the, the sort of key invariant, but we're going to try and figure out um, some local criterion about whether whether something should be a good point or a bad point. So a bad point would mean that you know it, if you count those ones, it's throwing off the prediction. <coughs> Um, so I have to say that this, I, I, this was, this is part of Emmanuel Pear's recent program about freeness of, of rational points. I, I've seen it discussed uh, already. I think um, Akshay and Jordan came up with a similar idea at around about the same time. Um, but the basic idea is to try and associate to each rational point uh, a lattice. And then uh, try and think about that rational point as being a good rational point if that lattice is well shaped and a bad rational point if not. And well shapedness is going to be uh, defined by the, uh, the relative sizes of the successive minima. Um, so here I'm taking a smooth uh, complete intersection. Um, which is cut out by these uh, K polynomials. And associated to, I mean, any, any point on your smooth variety has a, has a tangent bundle. And associated with that, we can write down a, a lattice, a tangent lattice, which I, I defined there. Um, so you, you sort of take the dot product with all of the gradient vectors associated to each of the, uh, in each of the forms. Um, I guess by Euler's criterion, uh, the point X that you start with is going to be, is, is certainly going to lie in this, it's going to satisfy all of these equations. So we mod out by um, multiples of X. And it turns out that that gives you a lattice of, uh, of rank N, and it's something that we can associate to every rational point. And so this uh, kind of very charming idea is to, to say that your point is, uh, is good or free if uh, if this lattice is not too lopsided, and this is quantified by asking that the largest successive minima of the lattice is is not too big compared to the uh, to the norm of, of the vector. <coughs> um, so 
I think Emmanuel, to, to do justice to Emmanuel Perra, I think he's much more fancy and he uses sort of the, the, you know, the language of slopes, Foster's theory of slopes, uh, to define his freeness functions, um, but it's completely equivalent to just looking at successive minima. And this so line. What is little? Uh, any oh, I see, I see the rank. <laughs> okay, the rank. Cool, the yeah, the dimension of variety, therefore, the rank could be uh, allowed. Yeah. So this. Uh, so this notion of freeness depends upon the choice of epsilon. Yes, uh, yes. It turns out in, in practice it it doesn't so much. Um, there are some funny situations where uh, you do need to pay attention to the epsilon, but for the examples I mentioned, it won't be so relevant. It comes from birational geometry. Uh, so uh, just as there's a you know there's beautiful analogy between integer points and FQ of T points. It allows you to transport uh, tools from algebra or languages from algebraic geometry <coughs> to this number theory setting. And uh, when you're looking at FQ of T points, you're really just looking at rational curves on varieties. And for people in the birational community world, it could be very nice when you have rational curves which you can deform and move around. And those tend to be what are called free rational curves, which are just, this is the integer analog of that. You're just asking that uh, when you pull back that rational curve, you get um, uh, globally generated sections. Anyway, it's a lattice for us, um, and we want it to not be too lopsided. And then the basic idea is just to say, well, what if we just look at these points? Um, does that sort out all of the problems around Manning's conjecture and awkward bad sets? Well, there's, I guess there's evidence to say that it, it can help. Um, so going back to uh, the example of the Fermat cubic surface, um, well, when you write down, this has obvious lines contained in it that we saw before. And it's not very difficult to prove that when you have a rational point which lies on one of these rational lines contained inside the surface, uh, that automatically forces um, the first successive minima to be essentially bounded. It just depends on the, but in fact, it's just bounded. And then the second successive minima is, is very big. And so this certainly, uh, this is this is great because this is agreeing with our um, our observation that lines, points on lines in cubic surfaces are bad. Um, I looked at this briefly with um, Will a few years ago in the sort of natural case of smooth hypersurfaces of low degree. Uh, so this is the sort of circle method world. Um, Birch's paper is able to count points on um, these smooth hypersurfaces 3D asymptotically, um, provided the number of variables is, is, uh, is exponential in degree. And so, yeah, here, I guess I'm, I'm implicitly taking the anti-canonical height, which if you, which is why you get a, a B here instead of a B to some power. So I guess the anti-canonical height here would be like uh, taking the norm of the vector X to the power of N minus D. And then that would, uh, <clears throat> and then that would produce just this uh, linear term in, in B, and you don't get any logs here. Um, and it turns out that if you if you take the number of variables to be just a tiny bit bigger, so like, well, I guess three, 1.5 times the number of variables, um, then you can also uh, produce the same asymptotic formula for the number of free points. Um, I think for any fixed epsilon, actually. So you can produce some, you can show that the number of non-free points is little o of x. So this is, Again, consistent with uh, what we expect to be true here, there weren't any accumulating subvarieties. There weren't any bad sets when you're looking at uh, these hypersurfaces of large dimension, and so we're not expecting free points to have much to to say about. Um, we're not, yeah, we're not expecting free points to play much of a role. And indeed, this is what this is confirming that if you looked at the non-free points, they would make a negligible contribution. 100% of points free. Um, 
And there's one more uh, case where we've been able to do something. Um, so this is the example of Grassmannians. Um, so these are the varieties, the the Fano varieties, which parameterize k-dimensional subspaces in the rationals in q to the n. Um, so it's a, a nice smooth variety. What's nice about them is the rational points on these things correspond to uh, primitive lattices of rank k, integer lattices of rank k, and the height, uh, this anti-canonical height uh, that you use in the Manning conjecture is exactly the co-volume of this lattice to the power of n. Um, Can't you use Eisenstein series for this? Yes, you could, yeah, yeah. Yes, I guess um, Schmidt's work predates that. Um, yes, it's true, but... but yeah, well, in fact, that's where the Manning... That's where they start. Yes, yeah, right, I know that. They work quite well. Yeah, they used um, these generalized Eisenstein series to, I guess they did something stronger. They looked at the height zeta function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. yeah. Not about Poisson summation. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, so you could, and I think you could also use dynamics as well, maybe to, to tackle this problem. Um, but anyway, you get an asymptotic formula. And so again, uh, it's reasonable to uh, ask if you just restrict to the free points, do you get the same asymptotic formula? This is again a situation where you don't see any, uh, any accumulating things to be removed. It's just a sanity check for this um, program of the manual pair. And, uh, and, and so that's what we confirm. Um, when you calculate the tangent lattice in this case, um, it has this sort of special form. Of, um, this is like a, the, just the jewel of the lattice in the ordinary sense, tensor with the, um, the jewel of the orthogonal lattice. And actually, um, yeah, so actually we, we proved something slightly stronger here. We actually study the, um, the equidistribution of this lattice in the space of, in the sort of appropriate space of lattices inside Rn squared. And you can use that equidistribution statement to recover information about how often your lattices lie, or how often your, your lambdas lie are such that um, the shape of this T lambda is very lopsided, lies inside the, the, the cusp of the space. Of the but you know, it's all like very good, but unfortunately, Will went ahead and spoiled this dream for forever and showed that there are actually some examples you can write down where it's not enough to just look at non free points to, 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 to explain the counter examples of the Manning conjecture. So, this was actually, uh, actually, this was again a problem of Schmidt from the 80s or 90s where he was um, essentially counting uh, points in SIM2 of P2. And uh, you get different asymptotic formulae coming from the different contributions from when your, your points lie in the diagonal of rational points in, in Pn cross Pn, uh, or are genuinely coming from uh, degree two points um, <laughs> cross Pn. Uh, a PhD student of um, the Rubidier analyzed this example and put it into the context of the Manning conjecture, and one finds that the this bad set is uh, is certainly a thin set, so it certainly agrees with this idea that you should be removing it. Um, but um, Will has shown that actually, even inside this bad set, most of the points are free, so it's not quite clear uh, how to how to make sense of this and. I guess I'll just end by summarizing some, some thoughts about directions one can go and, and where this leaves us. I mean, one, one reason to still care about three points uh, is the one I mentioned, namely where they come from. So understanding uh, these three FQ of T points, which you can often do using tools from analytic number theory, can still be a useful way of getting your hands on the locus of smooth points on a given parameter space for uh, uh, morphisms uh, for, for rational curves on, on, on a variety that you're interested in. 
So the non-free points correspond to singular points on this moduli space. And so some people uh, uh, work on trying to understand, you know, what's the, these, these parameter spaces are quite tricky to understand. And even questions like what's the dimension of the singular locus are not easy to understand, but it seems like uh, you can access those kind of questions by just counting free points in this setting of characteristic P. But you're taking what is X here? Any, any? Yeah, so whatever X you can count points on. Uh, so, uh, for but example, it will be highly uh, uh, non irreducible because degree. So yes. Are you fixing the degree here or what are you doing? Uh, I am, yes, you're fixing every P, e, the degree E. Yeah. I mean, the point E is the degree. E is the degree of the rational curve. Ah, okay, 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 okay. okay. Yes, and X is a fixed variety. Right. I see. So, for example, it could be a smooth hypersurface. Um, and you can, yeah, for, for a fixed E, you can certainly prove results. So is that a result or it's a question? Uh, in the case of X being a smooth hypersurface, it's a result. That you can you can say something about the singular locus. In PN. In PN. Yeah. Uh, but whenever you're in a situation where you can count rational points, that could be Grassmannians, that could be toric varieties, there is this alternative picture where you can try and say something about um, these moduli spaces. And in particular, if you're able to say something about uh, the non-free rational points, you're able to say something about the dimension of the locus of singular points on this moduli space. Yeah. So that's one reason to continue thinking a bit about free points. But let me say, uh, in, in more generally, uh, or, I mean, yes, given that Will has shown us that it can't hope to explain all counterexamples, you could at least say, one could at least ask um, if there's some classification of the problems <coughs> that you do expect it to, to handle um, uh, the bad sets. Um, I guess Will's example, the, the bad sets come from covers, could this, I mean, it's, I think it's still reasonable to suspect that the freeness could still uh, explain bad sets coming from proper subvarieties, for example. I don't know. Um, I guess there's this kind of correspondence between uh, Manning's conjecture and Mahler's conjecture, where you maybe count number fields of bounded discriminant and given Galois group. In that setting, uh, there's been some work about, uh, I guess, by Piper Harron and, and Andrew Bargava, where they look at equidistribution properties of uh, rings of integers associated to um, uh, number fields. And I guess the analog in this setting is uh, possibly um, these equidistribution statements about these uh, tangent lattices. Um, building on this, is there some sort of analog of freeness for Mahler's conjecture, which could be useful? I, I don't know. That, that could be interesting. There are certainly instances of Mahler's conjecture uh, which are known to be false, thanks to these counterexamples. Um, uh, 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 but it would be interesting to explore whether um, you could define a notion of freeness in that setting, which uh, might ex could explain some of the stuff that's going wrong there. Actually, it turns out that counting in these three points in each of the cases I've mentioned has been vastly harder than just counting the points. And that seems annoying. <laughs> I mean, the whole point is to, to try and explain things. I mean, you're counting fewer points. Maybe it should be easier. Um, I think it's fair to say that that hasn't panned out. And I guess it's still at a very early stage. It would be interesting to find examples where somehow removing the points and looking at these three points actually make analysis easier. Um, and finally, actually going right back to integer points, this is a completely reasonable question about, can you define a notion of freeness in the setting of integer points on cubic surfaces? And if you build freeness into, uh, into the counting function, I don't know, could that help us explain some of the discrepancies that you're seeing um, in the kind of Markov type equations? Um, uh, and maybe can it also um, explain discrepancies which might come from these presence of A1 curves lying inside the cubic surface? And I guess you could ask the same question for 
uh, rational points on, on K3 services. So K3s, I guess there, is some, there have been some papers where people have started to try to think about how rational points should behave on, on K3 services, um, but lots of things can go wrong. But maybe if you introduce freeness into the picture, that might um, smooth some of the difficulties. Um, yeah, I think that was all I had to say, actually. So I'll stop there. Any questions? So, can I? Yeah. So, for the Prasmani, and you said number of rational points can be counted kind of effectively. Yep. What about if I take arbitrary G mod P, then G the rational? Yeah. So, that's this example yeah. of. Uh, that, that, that's where they started, uh, Mani and Trinka, Chinko. They took Langman's Eisenstein series and interpreted the Eisenstein series as a, a sum of a rational points because it's a sum of a gamma. Yeah. And uh, and then interpret the uh, specific Eisenstein series as a height zeta function, counting the number of rational points of height less than x. And then Langman's theory that this has a meromorphic continuation, which is probably the deepest theorem in the subject, uh, gives you the first pole. You can read off the first pole, and that's how they made the conjecture. It's, the most, it's a natural example. Yeah. But, yeah. But G cube operates on that. If you take one rational point, then the rational points of the group will operate. And G, so does that cover a good number of rational points? What, what happens? Uh, of course, you have to take a particular embedding of G mod P. Yeah. But there's a kind of a canonical embedding of G mod P in some projective space. Yeah. So let's take that like minimal projective embedding. Uh, coming from basically the, the corresponding row, re, row representation of P. So if we take that embedding, then there is a, a particular rational structure. And the question is, how does G cube, the rational points of G, operate on the rational points there? Does it cover a, a, a like a, I mean, I mean this does not make any sense, but does it cover a good number of points there? I think so. I think it breaks it up into five. Yes, yeah, I think that's exactly what they do. Say it again. That's exactly what this is done in this paper. Of mine. Ah, that's I exactly see. what they do. I see, I see. Okay. But that, there's another thing that you sloughed over, which I've never quite understood. In the Manning conjecture, you may start and there's no rational points. So there's this whole game of passing. You stabilize first. You're allowed to pass to a, a bigger field, right? Oh, right. You want to say a word about that? Yes. What's uh, the philosophy? Uh, certainly, I guess these these Fano varieties, they're rationally connected. There's a feeling that yeah. there should be some finite extension after which you're going to get. Uh, rational points, now these are risky dense. Yeah. This is probably the theorem. Um, and so I guess, yes, to be to be precise, I mean, this problem is only interesting when there exist rational points. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> so, maybe, so, so is that part of the formulation, or is there a formulation which is supposed to I think first that, decide if you've got a rational point? Which yes. seems a much harder problem. I think that I think it's that situation. You assume that there are as a risky density of rational points, then you start this business. Okay. But yeah, I think in principle there's always a finite extent. By the way, uh, there is a similar conjecture to this sub varieties that often goes by the name Lang Bombieri, Bombieri Lang. And then in the general variety, say smooth projective, that uh, many points should come from sub. Some, certain sub varieties and accumulations on sub varieties. Uh, it's formulated. I mean, Lang wrote books trying to formulate that exactly. I should say that Enrico is, does not believe it. He wants he's removed his name from it. He just does not believe that's true. So he, after a lot of thought, has decided that that's too dangerous. But you, you can ask him, but okay. I'm telling you what he's told me many times. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, that's interesting. That's worlds away from what. Yeah, that's much harder than numbers. this because that's a general variety. Yeah. But but you're trying to count once there are many points, and then you're trying to say, well, I'm going to throw away all these sub special sub varieties. Yeah. It's the same philosophy. Uh, that is that there can be an overcount on these Absolutely. special sub varieties. But I'm just saying that the this idea that the world is so beautiful, I think, is nuts. I agree with him. Over Z, as you know, it's of course not. <laughs> And uh, you know any kind of laser conjecture that the world's nice over Q, I, I think 
we don't believe that either. Yeah, that's true. But also, as we saw here, there are these examples where it's not just proper sub varieties, yeah. which you have to remember. Right, right. So there's other sets which can be annoying. But we're happy when we can say anything about anything. <laughs> Yeah, Tom. Some more naive questions. In all these counting problems, it's like it, some power of log or some power of b times power of log. Is it ever the case that it's uh, um, slower, so like a power of log log or something? Uh, it can be, not, not, certainly not in the context that I've mentioned so far, but you can look at slightly different situations. Like another area that's interesting is to look at families of varieties and then ask how often elements of your family are everywhere locally soluble or have, have rational points and certainly that, that's a fairly natural counting function and certainly those there are instances in that setting where you get some log logs appearing but, but Manning's conjecture would not allow that right. yes right. certainly so, won't allow that it covers, so there's no so within within the setting of Fano and money yes they are conjecturing you can't have any weird behavior yeah, like a fractal set all over. Yeah. It hasn't been proved at least but anything covered by Madden's conjecture. If if there are points, then it has to go at least like say log log or some some, some lower bound to show this. Well, no, because we don't have access, we don't, we're not able to say that there are rational points. So we can't even so if, if you assume that there are conditionals that they're being rational. Uh, maybe if you pass to some extension, that there is one. The world of, I worked a lot on surfaces, but when you move to threefolds, it suddenly becomes uh, much more wide open. And I think essentially the only lower bound we have there, there's this, it's actually a very beautiful paper, a paper of Manning, where he goes through the classification of Fano projected threefolds, smooth threefolds. And in each case, he finds a way to produce a lower bound for the number of points, provided that you go to an extension. Um, but I mean, it's not a terribly, I mean, so for example, in the case of cubic threefolds, which is a very interesting case, I think all he's doing is noticing that if you go to a bigger extension, you can find a line which is defined over some, over, over the ground field, and then you get lots of points just because you've got a line. It's that kind of thing. But yeah, certainly I don't think there's anything globally of the nature that you mentioned. Yeah. So the tin set, uh, is it expected to be tin in the sense of uh, Sarah? It is, yes. That's okay. exactly that. Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. But I guess it's not quite easy to say that this is known because the conjecture is not known, but it is expected to be. Yeah, the conjecture is that, I mean, say, as you know, came up with this notion of thin sets. So it's like finite unions of uh, sets which are either contained inside, which, so the rational points are either contained in a proper sub variety or they lie in the image of some dominant map from an energy school variety. That's his definition. And then the, the conjecture is that. Provided that you are allowed to remove a thin set, then everything should behave as they should. And there's no counterexample to that statement. Okay. Yeah, it's just that, as I say, trying to pin down a priori what your awkward thin sets are might be tricky in general. Okay, sorry, I have a naive question. Yeah. So, in rational geometry, there's also a notion of very free rational yeah. curves. Is there something wrong with that? Yeah, that's the epsilon, actually. Um, so I had epsilon free was somehow a sort of measure of the, how free these points were. And I think when you unravel it, that's related to being very free, five free. So very free is free for all epsilon? Is that what? No. Uh, uh, I, I guess in, 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 in birational geometry, when you pull this morphism back, you get a vector bundle which splits as a product of line bundles and the condition of it being free is that you know each of the if it's if each line bundle is o of e each of the e should be non-negative and i think if it's very free then there should be at least one or something like that um but it's yeah somehow the epsilon is just related to the the r freeness that you just mentioned If there are no more questions, let's thank Timothy.